sure there'll be people that'll be trickling in slides. But nonetheless, just because I know I'm the I'm the last presentation before lunch, and I'll have to I'll have to stick to the, the schedule certainly, right? Yeah. Especially the way those especially the way the food's been out there today where you know if you're not if you're not quick enough that since coffee vanishes, this is Danish is vanished, so, so I definitely want to be on top of that. So welcome everybody. Uh, to how to make DevOps easy and reliable. Uh, an introduction to Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, my name is Frank Musio, a solutions architect, uh, covering state law discovery in higher ed in the Northeast. So I cover the state of Connecticut, uh, and I cover all of uh, higher education in the state of Connecticut, and by extension also K-12 in, in the state of Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, and a myriad of others. But I spend a lot of time here uh, since my counterpart, who, who will be in here in a few minutes, uh, is based in Windsor. So we spent quite a lot of time up here. UConn's a great customer of ours. In particular, we spent a lot of our time in the higher ed market here. There's plenty of others as well. And so I want to thank you for coming. What we're going to be talking about today really are, are two big things. <clears throat> First, we're going to talk a little bit about this notion of something called DevOps. Uh, so I'm sure some of you have heard of that term before. Many of you may even have a DevOps strategy in place in your organization. We're going to talk a little bit about what that term means. And more importantly, how do you take that term and how do you actualize it? How do you take that term and apply it to your normal business practices within your IT organization so that you can be effective? And interestingly, DevOps, as we'll kind of learn, isn't necessarily just IT focused, but how do we apply it to all areas of the business how do we leverage kind of the intersection of a variety of different disciplines to allow greater business agility and to allow uh, more productive outcomes from the resources that we're working with. So that's kind of the first focus, of the DevOps philosophy and what it means to you. And the second focus of today's presentation is going to be uh, how can we actualize that, how can we instantiate that philosophy using tools uh, that, that are out there, and one tool in particular that what we think is critical to uh, a DevOps strategy is a platform as a service. And in particular today, we're going to talk about something called Red Hat OpenShift, which is an open source platform as a service targeted towards developers and systems administrators that are embracing the DevOps philosophy and how they uh, can rapidly innovate their application development life. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. And so I just want to kind of kick the presentation off by so showing you two numbers up here, the number four and the number 80. And probably a lot of you are just kind of sitting here scratching your head saying, well, what does this have to do with DevOps? What's so relevant about these two numbers? Interestingly, if you were to take a look at the entire IT infrastructure expenditure globally, so if you're going to take a look at all the IT budgets in the entire world, so that's both in higher ed, in commercial, in healthcare, in uh, state and local government, in federal governments, it's about $3.8 trillion this year uh, of budget money that's dedicated to IT resources. Within the year, that's going to be $4 trillion in budget. And so $4 trillion in the global economy is going towards some sort of technology-related enterprise. And so, interestingly, if you <coughs> analyze this content, if you break it down, uh, you discover that 80% of all IT budgets are actually spent on keeping the lights on, on business continuity, rather than innovation. And interestingly, what we're finding more and more today, and this is probably something that you've all experienced in your roles, is there's a greater emphasis now, or at least from senior management, there's a there's a expectation that <coughs> IT organizations shouldn't necessarily just be um, liability and risk, in other words, cost, but should contribute to the bottom line of the organization. Has anybody has everybody felt that, or has anybody felt that so far? Right. You're not just you're not supposed to just be an expense for the organization anymore. You're supposed to contribute to the growth of the business. Right? That's in all aspects, right? So, in let's just take for example in the education world, well, IT is supposed to let's say in higher ed, you know, having a strong technology foundation, let's say for a university, 
is a competitive advantage against other institutions. If I'm a university and I have a strong technology program that's managed by my IT staff, that can attract more students and can generate more revenue for the university. In all areas of business, you see this. There's an expectation now from senior management, senior IT management, that our IT organizations should contribute to the uh, revenue generation of the organization. And so this number though here, this 80% is kind of disturbing, right? So if, if we're supposed to innovate, if we're supposed to contribute to the growth of our business, how can we do so if 80% of the funding that we have is going towards maintaining the status quo? Right? This is kind of the challenge that we all have as IT professionals today. And so we're supposed to be innovating out there, right? So a management comes to you and says, I need you to work on more projects. I need you to stop keeping the lights on. I need you to do things. Uh, we're supposed to be innovating, right? The problem is, it just keeps getting in people's way. Right? We're getting in our own ways. Right? This, is, this is a true story of mine. I was working with a state state agency uh, in, a, in a neighboring state, <coughs> I give you some context, and we had a project that we needed to get uh, completed in two days. So I get on site there, I think it was like a Tuesday, and we were supposed to be done Wednesday afternoon, and uh, I was working with the systems administration team, since my background primarily is systems administration, and we were, we were working on this project, but in order to get a virtual machine created for this project that we need to, to do, we had to interface with the virtualization team. Well, the virtualization team, the member that led the virtualization team there had a feud with the systems administrator the day before. And so he wasn't giving that person, a, he wasn't giving that team a VM, right? So we had to actually go up over his head just to get that VM created. And that, that took about a day. Now the second day, once we actually had the VM that we wanted, well then before we could actually connect to the internet and get out on the internet connectivity, we had to uh, interface with the security team and the networking team. So we needed to have firewalls created, and we had to uh, have the configuration blessed by the security team before it could actually go live. Those are our two different silos within this organization. So it ended up, uh, at the end of the two days, we got probably about a morning's worth of work done. And so that's something that you see, not necessarily just in state government, you see that in all IT, right? So, uh, Quick show of hands here in the room. How many of you maybe uh, work on let's say the systems administration side of the house? Okay. How many work on like the development side of the house, application development? Okay. Do you guys talk to the other team all the time? No. Right. How many of you operate independently, more or less, autonomously? Right. Yeah, it's a big problem. Like, sometimes when I when I give a talk on OpenShift, there'll be a room of sysadmins and they'll say, you know. We're always in constant battle with the developers. And sometimes it's a room of developers and say, oh, those sysadmins, all they want to do is hold the king, keys to the kingdom and I can't get my job done. Right? That's the type of the kind of silo nature that a lot of IT departments have. It's not just necessarily in development and systems administration exclusively. It's in VERT, it's in security, it's in networking, it's in a variety of different things. So in order to get projects done, it takes a long time. Uh, I work with a, a well-known institution in the greater Boston area quite a lot. And up until they adopted the cloud strategy, it took them one month for a team to get a virtual machine. From the time that they put in a request, went to the virtualization team, it was blessed by the security team, had the networking configuration done, and then returned finally to the developer, whoever needed that resource, it took about a month. Right? How can we innovate? How can we, how can we take advantage of that $4 trillion in IT budget if 80% of the time we're spending uh, is dedicated to the monotony and the bureaucracy of getting these projects done. And that's the problem. We're getting in each other's way. Like this poor kid, he's trying to score a touchdown here. <coughs> kind of his own team is tackling. That's what I feel like sometimes when I'm working. Right? Like he's pulling his hands down. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you felt like that a couple times too with some of these other teams you've been working on. Right, so that's kind of the problem that, that we're running into in today's day and age. And so you probably have heard of this term DevOps as an answer to this. And so DevOps really isn't a thing but it's a philosophy. It's an approach to maintaining and creating a synergistic relationship between the different organizations within the IT business to allow greater flexibility in delivery. That's kind of a fluffy term, right? It's kind of, it's kind of a marketing term. But what it really means is coming up with ways to increase operational efficiency 
by leveraging tools and leveraging policies in your organization that allow the boundaries that normally exist to be torn down. So uh, a great thing would be leveraging cloud technology. This is why a lot of organizations now want to have a cloud strategy, a self-service strategy, as they often uh, kind of say. A lot of customers come to me and say, Frank, you know, we, we, we we're heavily virtualized. Our developers normally consume virtual machines to build applications. But the problem is when they want to consume a virtual machine to build an application, there's too much power to <coughs> involved. We need some sort of self-service involved. Right? We want them to be able to go out on demand and access resources. How many of you here use a public cloud service? For things? Okay. How many of you use a public cloud service and the organization you work for would prefer you not to use it? A lot of times people come to us and say, too many people are running off to Amazon circumventing our IT policy. And so, so DevOps is kind of a, a solution to that, uh, a philosophical solution to that. But in and of itself, it's kind of a vacuous term. What we need is technology that allows us to do that type of collaboration. And so interestingly, for most organizations that want to adopt a DevOps strategy, what they end up doing is adopting a cloud strategy uh, to, to accelerate this. And so now, everybody has a cloud strategy, that, and nobody has a cloud strategy. Everybody knows that they need to increase the, the automation capacity of their IT shop, and they need to increase the level of flexibility that their developers and their systems administrators have for getting things done. If you look at the type of cloud offerings that are out there, in the community, what you typically find is that there are three different flavors or three different variations of, of cloud service. We're gonna focus on one in particular today. Let's we'll start with some others. So the one that's a real hot topic right now is infrastructure as a service. Everybody, has everybody heard of IaaS in here, infrastructure as a service? Okay. Has anybody not heard of infrastructure as a service? It's okay. Okay, sure, okay. Um, so infrastructure as a service is what most people think of when they think of a cloud technology. Infrastructure as a service is providing uh, resources on demand for users, but these resources typically tend to be virtualized hardware resources. So for an example, Amazon EC2, that's an infrastructure as a service provider. I go to Amazon, I need to build a Red Hat Enterprise Linux server. So I go to Amazon, I get compute resources given to me. Right? I, get a, I get some RAM. I get some storage, I get some networking, I get some CPU, I have those resources. It's my responsibility then at that point to install an operating system on top, install a middleware stack, and create and configure my application. All right, so you kind of notice here in the diagram, uh, if you look over here at the, at the kind of the gray area, these are things that are provided by the cloud service. So maybe, maybe get images and compute resources. All these things here, we bring to the table as a consumer of that technology. If you look over here on the other side of the spectrum, this is something that in certain circles and certain areas is really taking off that software as a service. Not so much for developers, but just for people that are in the IT world that are consuming some sort of uh, service. So software as a service is basically the most extreme form of automation and abstraction for cloud computing. Software as a service is basically everything is done and it's given to you. Right? You consume the application at the highest level. A good example of that would be like Gmail. Right? Gmail is a full email service, but you don't see all of the elements of Gmail. You just see the UI, you see the interface, and you access the resources based on that. Google Docs is another example of that. Google's a good, reason, a good example of software as a service. Obviously, for developers that are creating applications, software as a service doesn't do you any good because it's already built. You want to build your own app. So one, one area that's starting to really take off and is kind of turning and standing the cloud uh, service provider model on its head is platform as a service. And so platform as a service, you can kind of imagine is like the intersection of infrastructure as a service and software as a service. Right? And in a PaaS, the majority of the infrastructure that you work with is abstracted away, but what an, a developer does have at his disposal is application development environments. So typically when you want to build an application, 
what you find is that there's a lot of steps that are involved. The PAS is meant to solve those problems. Most people come to me when I talk about a PAS and they say, Frank, you know, we don't need a PAS. We have a PAS already. It's called our virtualization environment. If a, if a developer wants to build a, an application in my, develop, in my environment, what I do is, is I, you know, I have them fill out a ticket. And then once they fill out that ticket, I take a template in my virtualization environment, which is called VMware for an example. Take my VMware uh, template, I spin up that VM, I give it, I give it to that person, and I say, okay, I want you to run yum install foo bad and bar, or I want you to run apt get install, install your, your middleware stack, install your you know, install Apache, install uh, Ruby, Python, Perl, whatever, and here's your VM, and you're off to the races. And so that's a platform as a service, Frank, isn't it? And so I look at that person and I say, well, it's on the right track. But couldn't you automate even more of what you're providing that developer? Wouldn't it be nice if the developer didn't have to do any sort of systems administration? Right? The developer didn't have to you know, obtain a VM and install an OS and install a middleware layer, install you know, a, a runtime, install a database to work with that runtime. Imagine if all that was just given to him. How much time would he have, or how much additional time would he have to innovate and develop? Right? And they say, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, that's a PaaS. Right? So what a PaaS does is it takes care of all the systems administration for the developer and leaves the developer with a resource that allows him to create the application that he needs. In a lot of ways, developers are artists. At least that's, the, that's what they tell me the developer. I'm an artist. So I don't have time to do this systems administration. I want to work on my piece of art. Give me a paintbrush and let me run. Right? It's not like you give Leonardo da Vinci a paintbrush and an easel and say, well, you can't just start painting because you're going to have to, you have to build that paintbrush. You've got to adjust those bristles. Now you've got to mix some paint you know, before you can actually go out. Maybe they did that. They probably did that. But imagine if he didn't have to do that, what he would, what he would uh, create. Right? So that's, that's what a pad is. Right? And this is a nice, you know, it's kind of, um, a list of steps that oftentimes you'd have to go through just to get an application off the ground. You see the laundry list of steps to a physical environment. You gotta get the box. Once you get the box, you gotta get it wrapped. Once you get it wrapped, you gotta make sure you have power <coughs> cooling and everything else. And then once that's in place, well then you still need to install the OS. Still need to install the stack and everything else. Uh, virtualization is really not that much better with your typical like VMware environment. Right? Yeah, maybe you start with an you start with like a template. Uh, you know, and this stuff's kind of all at the beginning, you know, and then you, you deploy all that. You still have to do the systems administration to get that application up and running. With the pads, it's really, all right, I have the idea, I have the budget, I have the code in my mind, or at least I think I do. Let me go ahead and let me put that into a runtime and let me get off to the races. And that's what uh, pads provide. And that's really critical for, for individuals that are trying to adopt the DevOps strategy, right? Because one of the, one of the things that, that we can do both in the systems administration side of the house and the um, the development side of the house is we can tear down the boundaries of administration and allow us to innovate and develop the line of business applications that we need to, to add revenue or to contribute to the bottom line of our company or our organization. So that's kind of that's kind of what the PaaS thing is all about. Anybody use a PaaS technology? No one's kind of dabbled in it. If you haven't, you're really going to love it. That's a perfect what I, what I really want to focus on now, that we kind of have an idea of DevOps, we kind of have an idea of PaaS, is kind of how you can take advantage of tools that are out there, in this case in particular OpenShift, which I think is probably one of the most compelling, if not the most compelling paths, and I'll kind of show you why, uh, for, for adopting a DevOps strategy and adopting a PaaS in your environment. And so, first thing to kind of talk about is the, the different types of configurations, or what can I kind of obtain with, with OpenShift. And so OpenShift has been around for quite some time. Some of you, I know I spoke with you kind of coming in, some of you have heard of it before, some of you haven't. So OpenShift, it was launched originally a few years back as a cloud, a hosted platform as a service by Red Hat. And it's since then been uh, appropriated in a variety of different contexts. So there are three ways of consuming OpenShift today. Uh, OpenShift Online is the easiest way. It's a free service up to what we call three uh, gears, and we'll kind of talk about what a gear is. Free service, uh, free to start, and then there's there's a paid tier depending on the uh, you know SLA you need or the capacity you need. 
OpenShift Online, go to openshift.com. And if you if you like that premise, you like the PaaS solution, but you want to bring it in-house, you don't want it running in the public cloud, uh, there's a product called OpenShift Enterprise, which gives you platform as a service within your organization. And in, in keeping with uh, the spirit of Red Hat and open source, uh, we also have a community project called OpenShift Origin that's completely um, free and open source, able to be downloaded, consumed, and deployed, uh, and more importantly, contributed to by the greater community uh, out there in the world. Quick, very, very quickly before we move ahead, uh, how many of you are familiar with, with Red Hat as a company? Some of you. For those of you that aren't, one thing that I just want to kind of preface is one thing that we do is, is we're the world's largest uh, open source software vendor. And obviously everybody knows Red Hat Enterprise and Linux probably pretty well. But one thing that we're committed to as a company that, that I think separates us from a lot of other open source vendors is the fact that we will always sponsor and facilitate community innovation. So we will, nine times out of 10, whenever there's an enterprise product offered by a subscription with support, SLA, certifications, et cetera, we'll maintain a community implementation of that solution upstream that, uh, is, that is really kind of driving the innovation of that technology, where you can participate in that technology. Being part of the academic community in particular kind of gives you a lot of flexibility and empowers you to shape the way that your enterprise products are going to, to look and behave in the future. I just kind of wanted to preface that. Let's take a look at the rest of OpenShift itself. This is why I think you guys think this stuff is really cool. It's mind blowing and cool, actually. And so, the premise of OpenShift, OpenShift itself is a software solution that runs on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now that, that goes for OpenShift Enterprise and OpenShift Online. Uh, for the most part, we're going to focus on OpenShift Enterprise just for a sake of argument here uh, as a standard. But the same terms and the same configuration I mentioned to you would also be in the cloud service, so you wouldn't have to worry about accessing that and in the open source project. So everywhere you find RHEL, OpenShift as a software solution will be able to be run. And so when you, when you look at an OpenShift configuration, uh, what you'll find is that there are two different types of nodes in an OpenShift environment. There's something called an OpenShift broker on the one hand, and something called an OpenShift execution node or node on the other. And the difference between the two is a broker is a management platform. It contains application state information. It handles uh, dynamic DNS. So it handles name resolution for your application. It handles the kind of state of the application, the orchestration of the application environment. And an OpenShift node in your environment hosts your application. We use a container-based technology, we're gonna get into a little bit later, that will allow you to achieve incredible application density for your applications on your existing platform, on your, on your OpenShift platform. Now, OpenShift itself, your applications that you create within OpenShift run in something called OpenShift Gears. So an OpenShift Gear is a container, a, a Linux container technology that runs within OpenShift. This is how most people run OpenShift. They have a virtualization environment. They have their VMware environment using KVM, using OpenStack, something like that. And when they have that environment in place, they run OpenShift on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux VMs. So they almost like install OpenShift as an application. And then as that's running on those VMs, within those VMs, they have OpenShift gears that are created when you create an application. A gear is a completely isolated container that your application lives within. Think of it kind of like a VM, but much more fundamental because it doesn't have its own uh, hardware, it doesn't have its own hardware abstraction layer, but it shares the resources of the OpenShift node. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird stuff. Container stuff is kind of weird, I think, when you first hear it. But OpenShift gears are where your applications live, and these gears are defined by the Linux subsystem. So there are, there are three big components technologically that go into an OpenShift gear. The first is something called SE Linux. Anybody in here have a Linux background? Okay. How many of you that with the Linux background in the room hear the word SE Linux and you turn and you run? Probably everybody, yeah. right? Uh, so, so SE Linux, Security Enhanced Linux, is a mandatory access control framework for, for Linux uh, that you find primarily in, in Red Hat systems, developed by the NSA originally and now kind of we kind of maintain that project. 
Uh, but SC Linux, for all the grief that it's caused people in the past, is now a very viable solution. Uh, and the nice thing about OpenShift is that your applications, when you create them, are actually created within what they call an SC Linux um, namespace. And what that means is your application, as you're building as a developer, becomes uh, securely isolated within that container, so that if you have some sort of flaw or exploit within the application you create, and somebody takes advantage of that exploit, that exploit cannot run rampant throughout the rest of your application running in OpenShift. So you have a, a, a military-grade security technology built in the solution. This is my slide deck. Uh, for, for government institutions, sites for higher ed, and, and, and all systems, to be honest. Another part of the Linux subsystem that's used to create an open shift gear is the Linux control groups, the Linux C groups. This is a really cool technology. It's starting to really take off in enterprise Linux uh, capacity. Uh, Linux C groups is an element of the Linux kernel that handles dynamic resource allocation. So if you need to uh, control um, or, or prohibit things like runaway processes and things like that on your Linux, C groups can do that for you. C groups, though, in OpenShift have a very interesting purpose. They dynamically manage the resources of your OpenShift node for all of your applications. The nice thing about this is that it can handle application um, load and sensitivity. So as application load increases, we can dynamically scale um, OpenShift gears to allow your application to elastically uh, adapt to the, uh, to the increasing workload. You can also scale back down that, um, that resource. It's also good because it, it provides you with the, probably the most sophisticated the most sophisticated resource management that you can have on a Linux platform for an application, which gives you incredible application density. As an example, OpenShift.online last year, OpenShift.online had over 400,000 applications running on it on 16 nodes. So for 16 nodes, 16 physical systems, we had uh, 400,000 applications running. It's up over a million now. I think they grew it out to about 25 nodes. So C groups is an example of, of how we can get that type of application density. This is great to have in developing development environments. You start with a small OpenShift farm, two or three nodes, uh, and you will be set for thousands of applications.
do a command line interface. Just take the manager of RESTful APIs and running an open chip. Uh, as he's creating this application, his gear is being spun up that contains his application itself. The cartridges that he selects determine a type of middleware and the type of development language that he wants to work with. So there's a variety of different types of cartridges in OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift is targeted primarily towards open source development. So if you're doing things like Python, Perl, uh, Python Ruby, Perl, PHP, you know, Django is big now. And that stuff is all available for you with the latest iteration in cartridges running in OpenShift. We also have a, a collection of cartridges that are what we call pre-configured systems. So if I need a WordPress environment, like a WordPress cartridge, WordPress is stood up instantly. Don't have to worry about the MySQL, don't have to worry about all the other dependencies to scan that environment out. If I need a Drupal environment, click the Drupal cartridge, done. Right. That's the stuff that the developers don't want to normally deal with. They don't want to have to set up Drupal, they just want to use Drupal. They don't want to set up WordPress, they just want to use WordPress. We're also kind of experimenting with adding more proprietary um, languages within OpenShift that hasn't been it outright yet, but there's a push for having like .NET support and things like that also on the platform. We also have an extensive um, JBoss cartridge set. So if you're using Java-based, if you do Java-based development, uh, you can have full JBoss EAP instances running. Um, we need to drop in a database for your application. It happens a lot, right? I build a PHP app. I have the app, I have the runtime there, but now I need a database. And normally what happens, you have to just download the database, install it, declare all the environmental variables, tie everything together. In OpenShift for a developer, all they do is add another cartridge. That database is dropped down into the runtime, and as it's dropped down into the runtime, all the environmental variables are automated and instantiated. Yeah. Hey, I'm just curious, when you say add a cartridge, is that like? like click, point click. Okay, so, th yeah. so there's like a uh, OpenShift interface. Yeah, or and I'll show you, I have, this, I have, a, I have a video okay, that I can okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no worries. I'm just curious. There's actually a bunch of ways you can do it. You can yeah. do it through an IDE. So you can do it through a clip. The JBoss developers can do it. You can do it through the command line. You can do it in a variety of different ways, which is pretty cool. And, this, and you can do this on all of your major development platforms. So Windows, you can do that on OS X. You can do it on, on Linux. Depending on whatever your <coughs> development workstation looks like, you can take advantage of it. Now, when you actually create your application, and we'll actually see a video of how this works, I, I recorded it because oftentimes when you do, when you rely on like hotel wireless and things like that to do demonstrations, you can have all kinds of problems. So, ask the guy that was here before me, he was coming out there, oh man, I must have been working my virtual desktop disappeared. And so, uh, so, I did it ahead of time. Well, I'll show you just kind of the video of how this all, what this looks like. But once you actually create the application, um, the next thing you do is you, you, you develop on that application and you use, we use Git as a revision control system. So you, anybody use Git in here for their development projects? Okay. Uh, if you have it's pretty straightforward, I think you get used to it. It's, it's the most common revision control system for open source projects out there. Uh, one of the benefits is it's distributed in nature. So all developers can kind of carry around a local uh, source repository, make their modifications and push it up to the application as needed. Uh, we use uh, all Git calls. They're all encapsulated with an SSH. In fact, we use SSH for all the authentication. We use SSH keys for all the authentication in the environment. So everything is using IPsec grade encryption technology. So all of your Git pushes and everything is secure. So let's go, I'm going to show you that video so you can see what it looks. It's about eight minutes or so. But I think with OpenShift, you have to see the thing in action to really, to really kind of appreciate some of the some of the tools that are available. I think you guys will really want to. For those of you that are developers in the room, I think you're going to find some really compelling. Okay. So this is an example. I logged on to the OpenShift interface. I'm using OpenShift online in this example, but the interface is identical for enterprise. So if you have it on prem. So as a user, I log in. This is what all your users will be given if you give a username and password that an administrator can, can, can control. In case I'm logging in, my red hat credentials. You can do this for free, by the way. You can leave this room today if you can do this. Uh, so log in OpenShift online. The first thing I have to do is I have to create an application. So I select the create application link. 
Once I select the create application link, here you'll see all the different cartridges that are available. These are all the different runtimes. You'll see these instant apps, so there's your Drupal, there's your WordPress environment. Those are single clicks and you're done. See all kinds of different things that are available. Python, Ruby, different variations, PHP. So in this case, I'm going to create a PHP 5.3 app. So as a user, I click on the cartridge I want to use, and then I give this thing a name. And the one thing that's nice about pads is all the DNS has already been pre-configured. So I have it on my own DNS domain, and I'm calling this thing my test app, or my first app. You'll see there I can select whether or not I want this application to be scalable or not. Scalable means I'm putting a software load balancer in front of it so that if, if uh, demand increases, the application will spin up more gears to accommodate that. I'll hit the create application button. I was on hotel wireless, so I've, and this, this message here is just saying it could take about, uh, could take a while. In this case, it takes about 30 seconds. Why would you not want to make it scalable? Um, certain, certain cartridges just can't architecturally, and you may just have situations where you want to have restrictions over the, the size of the, the number of gears you're dedicated to it. Okay. So maybe you have other applications that you want to make sure that if they're scalable, so you want to reserve those resources. You know, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So now my application is created here. I know it's kind of hard to see with the resolution on the projector, but what this is giving me now is the actual Git syntax for creating, for downloading the local source code repository. Um, what you'll see is that in order to take advantage of a lot of this, this stuff, you can install the Red Hat tool, the Red Hat uh, OpenShift tool, just kind of showing the instructions. It's all part of the, the interface. So for OS X, for Windows, for Fedora, as a Linux distribution for RHEL, for Ubuntu, et cetera. And so I apologize about the resolution. I just put the projector. So I'll do my best to kind of, kind of narrow it. You'll see it gives you the git clone command that you would use. So this is if I want to actually create the local git repository for my application. So I'm just going to go into a terminal window here. And I'm just going to paste in that command that they gave me, which is just going to create a local Git repository of my app on my local workstation. <coughs> and you'll see it prompts you for the SSH, uh, the SSH public key from the OpenShift site. I've already uploaded my public key, so authentication has already been taken care of. Right. So now I'm actually working within my application source directory. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create like a test.php page. But before I do that, you'll see if I can go back into OpenShift and click on my application, it's already resolvable in DNS. So this is what my application looks like right now. This is the index.php file. It's just a splash screen, but it just shows that that's immediately resolvable in DNS your application is live. I'm going to go ahead here and copy a hello world script. I'm just going to call this uh, test.php. What's the URL look like? I'm curious. <laughs> the URL is when you, when you set up an OpenShift account, at least in, in public OpenShift, or if you do it internally, you create as the administrator, or I should say, in OpenShift Enterprise, you determine what the DNS subdomain is. In OpenShift Enterprise, it's just going to be your like username .rh cloud. Well, that's publicly that's publicly resolvable though. Cool. Um, so now what I'm doing is I'm, and I know I apologize, it seems a lot better on my, on my, on my laptop screen, but uh, making the change, doing a git commit and then pushing those changes up to the OpenShift site. So mind you, this is all happening in the cloud right now. Right? I don't need to have a development environment. And if I wanted to bring OpenShift Enterprise in-house, it'd be the same workflow for my developers. So, so I ran a git push, push that source code back up to the application. I'm just going to run a forward slash here and do test.php. And my hello world script is going to show up there on the public internet immediately. So now, the next thing I'm going to do is, in here, I'm going to show you something called the RHC command. This is part of the command line tool. So the, all the stuff that we just I just showed you in the web UI, you can do in the command line also. I know it's kind of hard to read, but that, those are the those are the RHC commands that you can work with. And what I'm going to do here is run something called RHC app create. It's a command that you would use to create an application. So if I'm a more command line happy type of guy, I am personally, so if I was using this in production, I'd probably use the RHC tools more. I'm creating the same PHP 5.3 app, just giving it a different name, hit enter, and that application is now being built in OpenShift. Right? So, I'm, 
So I'll go back up to the website and you'll see it's, it's present there. So this gives developers, with, whenever they have an internet connection, uh, access to the application that they're building and working with. Or in your environment, anywhere with a VPN connection. creating the application. I'm using the three, the kind of the three version gives you three, what we call three, three small gears. Small gear is half a, half a gig of memory, gig of storage for each kind of application. You can build a scalable app. Uh, for the hosted service, there's then a paid tier if you want to go up and get more capacity and more storage. But, but for, for just starting off with OpenShift, the three small gears is a great way to get involved with and with enterprise, the administrator determines what they want to do. So now you'll see that test.php app is up there. One thing that's also really nice, because it is a PaaS and because it's fundamentally a Linux system, you can manage your application as if it was a Linux VM. So here what I'm doing is I'm going to copy in an SSH command. It's going to SSH me into my gear, into my container. And you're going to see it has its own process set. So it appears to the application that it's its own Linux distribution running. But it's actually running as a subset container within RAP. So you'll see that SSH in the box run top here. Uh, you'll see then, you know, there's a few processes running Apache, things like that. If I was a, if I had a scalable application, you'd have like uh, some of the software load balancing processes would be running. And that's run so it can't talk about anything else. Right, it's completely isolated. So even if I, even if I do like rm-f slash, you know, on, on that particular application, all the other applications will be fine. Sorry? Or SQL injection. Or yeah, anything like exactly. that. Exactly. So one way that database, not the other. In fact, we there was a PaaS um, initiative in, in the Department of Defense, and OpenShift was selected as the solution because of the security. Because yeah. you get the military grade security for free, maybe, and you don't have, as an SD Linux user, you don't have to worry about it. So let's imagine now I actually want to add another cartridge to my environment. What I just did here is I selected the uh, MySQL cartridge. So if I just if I need a, a my if I need a database for my application normally you know in the in the in the um, in the, in the non-pad world I'd have to install that application maybe I'd use a yum install MySQL 5.5 or MariaDB or whatever or app get install foo and then I have to configure everything that's the hardest part for developers <coughs> like that but here you'll see the MySQL database was dropped into the application automatically all the environmental variables were declared and it's functioning as a database. And so I was toying with the idea of whether or not I wanted to go in and, and kind of go walk through the database and actually do some stuff, but I figured it'd probably be a little long-winded for a, for a video. But that's kind of an excerpt of what OpenShift looks like in action. That's something that I think you guys will, will find very interesting if you explore it. And the great thing about it is that you can start for free with any pads, and it's a great way to adopt a, a DevOps strategy for your environment. So what do you guys think of that video? Do you think that was pretty cool? Is that pretty slick stuff? It makes me excited. I think it's, I think it's one of the most interesting technologies to come out of the open source community in a long time. Uh, the other one being OpenStack, which we'll do a talk this afternoon if anybody's interested. At 2.30, we're gonna do an OpenStack and one on one intro to OpenStack. I think it's pretty neat. Now for a lot of people that actually they actually uh, for a lot of you that are interested in OpenShift, and they say, this is a really great technology, we've been using it on OpenShift online, we're thinking about moving it into a production environment within our organization, you know, but we have some questions about how we can do delegation of responsibility, how can we do separation of, uh, or life cycle separation, can we do those types of things in OpenShift, and the answer is yes. So when a lot of people come to us and say, we really like OpenShift, but we want to be able to segregate the type of applications that are running on the types of OpenShift gears and the OpenShift nodes. And so maybe we want to have like a dev environment where we do our development work. Interestingly, OpenShift started off as just a dev environment, a development creation environment. But because of the nature of the technology and in true DevOps spirit, the tool can also be used as a hosting environment. So you can use it for hosting production applications as well. And so if, this is the wrong clicker. Just two clickers are right the wrong um, So we have this concept that OpenShift is something called districts. So a district is a logical separation of OpenShift gears. 
and, and, and nodes that can isolate application development within a certain boundary that you define. It's a fancy way of saying I can restrict developers from creating dev applications here, QA here, production here. And so this, again, in kind of the DevOps sphere, allows me greater flexibility. I can not only empower my developers, because that's what we always <coughs> want to do, we want to give them the flexibility they need, but at the same time, what we also need to do is we need to make sure we enforce our corporate policies uh, and our organizational policies. And so this can allow us to do that. I mentioned a little bit about the scaling technology earlier. Um, so one of the really cool things about OpenShift and one of the cool things about PADS in general is they generally have this scalability technology, being able to horizontally scale as load increases. Sometimes you don't want to go through the work of building this application, only to find out that the application is so successful that your hosting infrastructure can't take advantage of it because there's too many requests. And so one of the neat things about OpenShift is this kind of scalability feature. When you create an application, you can mark it as scalable. And what that does is it actually spins up a separate gear with an HA proxy software load balancer uh, with a threshold that you define. And if the threshold exceeds that value, let's say it's 500 connections within five seconds, I don't know, let's just say for argument's sake. A separate gear can be spun up, the application can be distributed across that gear and can take advantage of the increased load. So this has actually had a lot, of, we've had a lot of customers that are interested in using this in, in um, like student registration systems, let's say at universities for example, when it's like spring or fall semester registration, they build the application for student registration. Obviously most people are just looking to register for classes at those two times of the year. Yeah, you can still pick up a class during the add drop period and things of that nature, but it's generally right, you know, before the start of this, the fall semester and the spring semester, we have a heavy load. They build the application on OpenShift, and then what happens is as the students are kind of saying, I really want to get into that, you know, that oceanography class, well when they're doing that, the application can dynamically scale and, uh, and accommodate that increased capacity. And then when everybody now locked out of the oceanography class because it's full, well then the application can be scaled back down. So when the demand subsides, we can relinquish the resources back to the OpenShift pool. Um, in our space that, that Mike and I in the back room work on, uh, in, in uh, state and local government, this is also big for like emergency response systems. So you see certain cities and states that are building emergency response systems on things like OpenShift because of that scalability. Because when there's a disaster, that's when everybody goes to the website. Or when there's a snowstorm. But when that snowstorm's over, I mean, nobody's really going there anymore. So it's a great example of using the elasticity of the technology. This is a little bit more information on the HA proxy. Uh, yeah, we won't, won't really go into that at, at this point. So that's kind of what the OpenShift landscape looks like. It's, it's a web interface, it's a command line driven technology, it's an, it's an IDE driven technology that allows you as a developer to create your application and then more importantly, um, standardize the deployment model for that. That's kind of OpenShift as, as a, in a nutshell. And just to kind of wrap things up, because I know now I'm standing between now and lunchtime, I bet you it's almost time for lunch, right? I think I'm a little over. Uh, but why DevOps? You know, why, is, why is something like a DevOps strategy important for you in an organization? It allows you to quickly create and deliver modern applications. It allows you to transcend kind of the siloed boundaries that you normally have in the IT space while still giving you consistency and operational excellence. And then why would you want to consider something like OpenShift for your, your PaaS strategy and, and it, as a consequence of that for your DevOps strategy uh, because it's an open source solution which is very important when you're trying to build a DevOps strategy. We didn't even talk about that too much, you didn't have time. But building on a proprietary stack limits the flexibility that you have. The fact that you can take advantage of both on-premise and hosted configurations and the fact that through things like SE Linux and the Linux subsystem, you have enhanced security and enhanced multi-tenancy capabilities. All the things that universities, school, uh, K through 12 school system, state and local governments, federal governments, commercial entities, what everybody's looking for can be found in this product. I hope you enjoyed that uh, session and I will free everybody for lunch. Thank you very much. If you have questions, feel free to stick around. Uh, by the way, um, as by now you probably figured out this is a very flexible and <coughs> feature-rich environment that we even open up uh, any kind of bottle.